Oh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's actually been quite a while since my last video. I think the last one that I did was that workshop on object-oriented programming that I did at Leiden University back in the spring. Um, it is now early 2020, and I have moved back to the United States. I've taken a faculty position at the College of William and Mary, so I'm in Virginia now. But I wanted to come back with a new series that looks at recapitulating a particular algorithm that's been very useful for me in my research. Uh, and that is a, an algorithm that does intertextuality detection. Now, a couple years ago, I published a piece that looked at precisely this problem because although a lot of people have been working on this and a lot of people have, have developed really good tools to help us study intertextuality in large collections of documents, they didn't quite work very well for my own purposes. So I elected to adapt an algorithm that was developed by biologists called the Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. Now, this is an algorithm that is designed to find similar sequences of DNA in the genome. And it's very useful or the concept, at least, is very useful for people who are working with language, natural language documents because the principles are very similar. Essentially, we are looking for similar strings, uh, similar sequences of strings in longer sequences of strings. And that's really all it is. But when I put together the tool that I use to study intertextuality, I didn't necessarily do it in the easiest to use fashion, and I've learned a lot since I put this tool together in the first place. So I thought it would be really interesting to do a new series where I essentially work through the nature of the algorithm and code it together with you. And I'll build it as an installable library, that way you can install it and use it yourself if you'd like or you can follow along and actually code together with me. The goal is to look at the Python principles that are necessary to do this, as well as actually it to work through the process of moving from a concept, an algorithm, to an actual implementation of that, and just to make it clear what exactly I'm doing. And also, I'm going to clean up the code, I'm going to put it in modules and make it a lot more straightforward, and maybe even speed it up a little bit. But in order for this to actually be useful for anybody, I think it's important to step back and think about why we might even care about this. Uh, I am not alone in my interest in this. As I mentioned, a lot of other tools exist that help us study intertextuality. Uh, there's the Viral Text Project at Northeastern, there have been teams at Göttingen University in Germany working on problems like this. Uh, it's a very, very common thing. But sometimes implementations, if they weren't designed around the problem that you specifically have, they can be a little bit difficult to use, or at the very least not designed in the way that is exactly what you want. So often when I'm working with large collections of documents, and I work in Chinese studies, so I'm working with pieces that were written mostly from the 15th to the 17th or 18th century, and I often want to know, do they copy from each other in any sort of meaningful way? And I don't necessarily know beforehand which texts actually copy from which other texts. So I want a way to kind of explore this among hundreds and possibly thousands of different documents. So looking for specific phrases that are shared is really difficult if I don't already know what those phrases are, and it's basically impossible when you consider the fact that I'm still interested in cases where maybe a few characters here or there got changed. So the way that the basic local alignment search tool works, at least the conceptualization that I have taken to create my own implementation, it lets me define how long of a shared piece of text I'm interested in. So let's say I'm interested in 
any sequence of characters that are at least 10 characters long. This works well in Chinese, this is not enough in English. And as long as they're at least, let's say, 80% the same, I want to see them. So wherever there's a sentence that is basically the same across two different texts, I want to see that example. So I'll kind of work through with you how this happens in practice with my algorithm. And this is a, a conceptual version of it. This is not actually the implementation, but we will do the implementation together. So once I've decided, I want to see everything that's at least 10 characters long and at least 80% the same, I need a way of actually finding those examples. So to give you a sense of what this looks like, let's take a look at a, a hypothetical example, a synthetic example. If I want to compare text A, which I have here on the left, and text B, and I want to see, are there any strings or quotes that are shared between the two? Well, what I can do, and the way that Blast works, is I divide the first text into short chunks of characters known as seeds. And the length of these seeds is entirely up to me, but I found that a seed length of four characters works pretty well. So what I'll do is I'll take the first four characters in text A, and I'll search for them in text B. If I don't find any results, I'll move on to the next four characters. And I'll keep doing that until eventually I'm going to find a match. Now, and I should apologize right now, if you have seen me give a talk on this algorithm before, you've seen something quite similar to this, I have adjusted it a little bit for this recording, but um, I should apologize right away. This is probably repetition for at least a few of you. But getting back to what's happening here, once I find a match of these four characters, what I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, I'm interested in 10 characters at minimum that are the same. So I'll extend it out to 10 characters starting from where this match occurred. And so what I'll see in this particular example is it's all C's, but there's a D in here, okay? So this is 10 characters and one of them is different. Now, I measure the similarity between these two strings using something that's known as Levenstein distance. And I have not implemented this myself. There is a wonderful library in Python that already does this. Uh, but what Levenstein distance is, is essentially it's a measure of how many characters we need to change to transform one string into another. In this particular case, to turn text B, this substring here, into text A, I'll, all I need to do is change D into C. And so this has a Levenstein distance of one, uh, and the ratio is it's essentially 90% the same. So this is, it meets my minimum length requirement, and it meets my similarity requirement. So what I'll do is I'll just start expanding this and checking. So I'll move to the next character and check the similarity. And is it, as it gets longer, you'll notice that this similarity is going to go up. But eventually, I'm going to get to the end of this matching string, and all of a sudden, we're outside of this textual sharing zone. So I keep going until eventually, this is going to fall below my minimum similarity threshold, in this particular case, 80%. So what I do now is I simply chop off the end of that since it started falling, and then I return this as the match. So what this lets me do is this lets me find every case of these shared strings between two documents. And then I can simply do this over and over again for every document that I have until I get all of the matches in a corpus. If I'm going to do, if I implement exactly what I just described, that's going to be extremely slow. Uh, in fact, what we really do is much faster than that. But we'll get into that in the next episode when we start actually implementing this. But this is the goal. We're going to implement this. We're going to load in a corpus of texts, find every match, and we're going to return a, some representation of that. And if we have time, we'll get into visualizing it. Okay? We're going to design this as a library. We're going to design this so it can be installed and reused uh, across your system. So. In order to do that, um, I'm just going to go ahead 
and I'm going to start a new project and I'm just gonna do that inside a folder that I'm gonna call YouTube so I'm gonna start uh, whoops I'm gonna start a new folder that I'll call uh, intertextuality demo something like this so inside this particular um, in this directory this is where all of the code is going to go so I'm gonna have a new folder and this folder I'm gonna keep doing that uh, is going to be called uh, we'll just call it intertext for the moment okay it doesn't actually matter too much because we're going to be we can change this later if we want okay there are a few components that we need if we're going to build a library that we want to package. Uh, inside this intertext folder, we're going to need an initialization file. Uh, so I'll go ahead and I'm going to open uh, VS Code, which is just what I prefer to use. I'm going to make a new file. I'm just going to save it uh, as go in here, 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 and here. And I'm just going to save it as underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, dot py. And so this is going to be, this is what signals essentially to Python that this is a module. Okay. So let's go back here and let's set up the other things that we're going to need for this. Uh, so I need not in this intertext folder, but in the uh, intertextuality demo folder, I'm going to need a few extra things. I'm going to need a file that I'm going to call setup.py, and that should be saved here. Um, I'm going to have a license file, and this is where I'm going to put the license. Now, I generally prefer, uh, prefer the Apache 2 license. Uh, but really any open source license will be pretty good. Um, and then I'll have a readme file. And for those of you who are interested, there is a very easy tutorial of how to do this on Python's website at packaging.python.org. There's a tutorial on packaging projects that makes this extremely easy. So, and I'm just following that, okay? So in my setup file, I'm going to need to do a few things. I'm going to need to uh, import setup tools. And there are a few things I can do here. I can uh, add a long description that is pretty easy to do. Um, I can open this readme.md um, and they do as fh, but I'm going to do as rf just because that's my own habit. And I'll say long description equals rf.readme. Okay, so that's relatively straightforward. But we're also going to need um, to add some things in the setup. So we'll do setup tools.setup. And then here we give it a bunch of different information that describes our project. So we'll have a name, uh, and I might just call this, uh, well, this is actually language agnostic, so let's not call it Chinese text reuse. I'm just going to say, text reuse um, dash uh, pkg dash firth. Okay, that's just a username that I tend to use. I'm going to say this is version um, 0 0.0.1 um, and I can set up a few things. The author is, you know, me. Um, and I can add a few other things, so I'll do that. So in this classifiers list, um, I can add a lot of information about what about this particular project. So I can, for example, tell it that I, it's in the programming language um, Python, and it is three. And I can add a few other things like what's the license, what's the operating system, and I'll add a few of those maybe in the future. 
And then I'll say that this requires, you know, Python requires, um, let's say, greater or equal than 3.7. Uh, that's not actually technically true. It doesn't require anything but Python 3, I don't think, but we'll just go ahead and save that. Now, the last thing I want to do is I also want to specify what my dependencies are. And there is one dependency in this, uh, in this library, or there will be. And in order to specify this, all I actually need to do is I need to say install requires equals um, the name of the package, and it is python dot or dash levenstein. Okay, and so this, oops, is in fact all this really requires. So now this is all set up. Now that this is done, let's go back here. I'm going to go ahead and start up my terminal, and I am. I'll make this bigger so you can see it a little better. And we will say um, CD uh, YouTube. This is intertextuality demo. Okay, and I'm just going to go ahead and say git init, git add all, and git commit and initial commit. Because I want to be sure that I'm doing this properly. Okay, and so I am going to be using git to make sure that I keep track of everything that is involved here. And while I'm thinking about it, why don't I go ahead and also add a git ignore. I'll save this as .git ignore. And this is going to basically let me tell git what I don't want tracked. So for example, I'm using a Mac, so I don't really want it to keep track of the DS store file, which is kind of keeps track of the history of the, repos of the directory. Uh, and maybe later there will be other things that will add to this. So I'll save this. We're all set. Okay, so in the next episode, we're actually going to go ahead and start programming this intertextuality algorithm. And the way it actually gets implemented is a bit different than I described because, as I mentioned, that would be quite slow. And so we'll start getting into that uh, next time, and I really hope you'll join me then. So thank you. Take care.